Okay, I guess we are we are now live. So so I kindly ask uh, my my crew to let me know, uh, of course, if we have problems with my audio or video, but I think everything should be fine. So um, so good morning. Uh, Good afternoon or good or good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm your host for today. I'm Massimo Martelli, and I'm a researcher at the National Research Council of Italy and the General uh, Secretary of ISTVS. It is uh, my pleasure to welcome you to this uh, episode of our 2021 uh, digital event series. And as you probably already know, these, these events take place on Wednesday, and we chose a time to make it possible for all international colleagues to attend. So midday in Europe, Africa, mornings in North America, and evenings uh, in East Asia. Uh, today, we have, we have a slightly different schedule. So we are starting two hours uh, after our usual time. And I hope that's not a problem for anyone. And uh, in our series, uh, we alternate weekly between uh, informal led, informal student led research seminars uh, and lectures, what we call our Terra Mechanic Bytes uh, by established, uh, established researchers. So today, Today we are having a Terra Mechanic bite, uh, Terra Mechanics models for lunar and planetary rovers, and our our speaker for today is Dr. Lutz Richter, uh, ISTVS first vice president and regional secretary for Western uh, Central Europe. He is currently uh, head of development at Large Space Structures GmbH. And Lutz has been involved in several planetary rovers mis rover missions to Mars and working on the development of space robotic systems for over 20 years. And I would like to give you just uh, some general information uh, be before we start uh, with the actual presentation. So. Uh, on the sidebar, uh, on the right-hand side of your hop-in page, uh, you'll find a, a section called Sessions. Uh, in there, you'll find a chat tab. And I would like to invite every one of you to use it to introduce yourselves, uh, typing your name, affiliation, and research interests. And please, and please use this tab just, just for this purpose. Then, in the same session, you'll find another uh, tab called Q&A, uh, where you can instead type uh, questions for our speaker. At the end of the presentation, we are going to have a Q&A and open discussion with the, possi with the possibility uh, for those in attendance to be invited uh, to share their audio and video and join uh, the live conversation. And we strongly uh, encourage uh, every one of you to to do so. But of course, if you feel more comfortable comfortable just uh, typing in your questions, uh, that's fine as well, and we will take care of them anyway. And so now, if uh, if our speaker is ready, uh, we can start with the with the presentation. And Lutz, uh, you can take it from here. Yes, hello everybody. I hope the audio is satisfactory. Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Very good. I have to apologize. I you will not be able to see me because uh, from where I'm speaking, I don't have a webcam here, unfortunately. But I can assure you it's live. <laughs> I'm <laughs> talking to you live. And uh, also when we do the Q&A part, um, we can interact live, obviously. 
Right. No, I'm very happy to be able to to speak here. Um, and let me share my screen. We rehearsed this before. And um, so let's see if it works out again, like in the rehearsal. I hope it's full screen now. Massimo, can you confirm we're full screen? Hello? Sorry, sorry, Luth. I I was uh, temporarily uh, disconnected. Yeah, I can see you full, uh, full screen. And before you start, uh, there's an important information uh, that I need to give to to our, our audience in in the top right corner uh, of your hop in uh, screen uh, you will find an icon with three dots and uh, uh, clicking on those three dots you will have a full screen option so in case what you're seeing is too small uh, to see uh, because of course you have all the other sections of the hop in interface uh, you can click on the full screen options so that you get just the presentation being full screen. And then, of course, at the end uh, or at any time where you need to access again the sidebar, you can uh, click on the same icon and then exit full screen. So, yeah, that was the, the final information I had uh, forgotten about for our audience. So, uh, sorry about that. And... Please, Lutz, uh, I'll leave it to you. Yeah, thanks very much for the introduction. Um, yes, Terra Mechanics models for, for lunar and planetary rovers. I'm very happy to talk about that subject because I've, I've been working on, these, um, on this topic for a number of years. And I think it's quite interesting. Um, Right, so planetary and lunar rovers and planetary exploration, lunar exploration, what does it involve? Um, so there are a number of space missions uh, these days without astronauts um, that are going to the surface of the moon, that are going to the surface of Mars to do things. Uh, usually it's for science. Um, and some of these missions include sampling, sample acquisition. You see some photographs here of uh, current missions slash mission hardware. Um, and a number of these missions involve mobile ground vehicles, uh, which are also referred to as planetary rovers, lunar rovers. Um, and let's go on. So such planetary surface robotics, if you will, um, what are they characterized by? Uh, what is involved in terms of technology? So since they are, they involve moving degrees of freedom or actuated degrees of freedom. So they, they involve electromechanical systems. Uh, so moving uh, devices, uh, wheel drives, uh, manipulation systems, robotic arms. So they involve actuators, electric actuators. Um, and then also a fair degree of autonomy because in, in many mission scenarios, there is no, no possibility of real-time intervention from Earth because of signal round-trip time, uh, because of communications constraints, especially for Mars missions. For the Moon, it's much more simple because it's so close to the Earth. And you can do, in most cases, real-time control from Earth of, of uncrewed ground vehicles. But for Mars, it's certainly different. For asteroids, it's certainly different because of the distance and signal round-trip time. So autonomy is important. And then finally, soil-machine interaction uh, which brings us to terra mechanics because um, these ground vehicles, rovers, or also sampling systems, they are at ground level. So, and there are no roads on the moon yet. There are no roads on Mars yet. So it's unprepared terrains. It's natural terrains. It's soil. Uh, it's rocks. Um, so 
uh, these ground vehicles, these rovers, they have a soil machine interaction element in them or that discipline is part of the system, part of the problem. So in other words, um, planetary ground vehicles, they interact with the surface materials, with the terrain. There are some photographs shown here at the, in the bottom row, let's say, that I would like to point out. Uh, so one of the 1960s surveyor, US lunar landers, robotic uh, un uncrewed landers. Surveyor 3 was visited by the Apollo 12 crew that landed nearby in a pinpoint landing, which is why this picture was taken on the bottom left. Um, but landers, I was just going to mention, also the Apollo crewed lunar module footpad, uh, an example of which is shown on the, in the bottom of this slide. Uh, landers, landing vehicles, they interact with the terrain as they touch down. Um, there's a deceleration, there's a, a, sh a shock-like event as the surface material is compressed at the instant of touchdown. So there you have an interaction with the terrain. And then once you are on the surface, then mobile vehicles, ground vehicles, rovers, um, uh, them having wheels, they they will interact with the terrain as well. And in the bottom right, you see this photograph um, of one of the Mars rovers of NASA, MER mission, one of the wheels and the imprints uh, it leaves on the, on the ground. Uh, so you have a terrain interaction as well. Um, so as we've got ground vehicles on unprepared surfaces, um, some things can go wrong and they have gone wrong in planetary rover missions. Some examples shown here, for instance, the, the NASA MER Mars rover mission with spirit and opportunity, let's say twin, two identical rovers sent to do to uh, two different places on Mars uh, about 15 years ago. They, a mission that I was involved in, uh, by the way, they, there were a few instances of the rovers bogging down uh, in unexpectedly soft terrain. You see evidence here in these images that were taken by the rovers. Uh, there's also a simulation view as well in the center. Um, so there were occurrences of that um, and in and, and several cases it was possible to, to extricate the vehicles with careful planning from Earth, from the ground. But in one case, one of the rovers got permanently embedded, uh, which was Spirit, and it was never possible to, to, to free it again, so it remained stuck in place. Um, and succumbed to Martian winter because of unfavorable tilt of its solar panel to the sun. So it got into a low power mode. It, um, so things can go wrong. Um, if let's say the capabilities of the design of one of these rovers is exceeded, uh, which may happen in real operations on the planet, on the object in question. So that, that kind of highlights the importance of careful design of such rovers. And one aspect, I mean, the one of relevance here and also of relevance to ISTVS, to our community, is the mobility system sizing. So planetary rovers, lunar rovers, on the one hand, they can be considered like spacecraft, like satellites. It's just that they are not in free space, but they're at ground level, but they are in a very hostile environment. It may be vacuum and strong temperature swings. But here, what I would like to highlight is resizing, um, which is related to Terra mechanics. Because just as for ground vehicles on Earth, you need to pay attention in the design to a few aspects. One of them is ground pressure. Uh, like in terrestrial uh, ground vehicles, the design needs to make sure that ground pressure is not too large for the terrains considered. Because if ground pressure is exceedingly large, then you will have excessive sinkage uh, in operations with possible immobilization of the vehicle. So ground pressure is very important. This is related to the careful and correct 
sizing of the ground contact area. So in the case of wheels, um, make your wheels big enough uh, or make your wheels soft enough. If it's elastic wheels, that ground pressure is low enough. And then the other aspect is, um, let's say the kinematics of the suspension. On, on flat terrain, it's much less of an issue, but in natural planetary terrains, uh, frequently you have rocks scattered on the ground, um, ejected by cratering events, and the mobility system should be designed such that the suspension can handle a fair percentage of these rocks sitting around. In other words, that the vehicle is able to care uh, to to pass over a fair fraction of these rocks without having to avoid them for an efficient design. And then the other aspect that's the bottom line here on this chart uh, for planetary and lunar vehicles, you have to be sure you design the suspension and the rover to be collapsible uh, to a certain degree, which is driven by the need to fit into a landing spacecraft into or on top of a landing spacecraft, depending on the design of the mission. There's an additional constraint that usually you do not have in, in earthbound ground vehicles, the need to partially fold the suspension for compact stowage, which is an important design driver in, in planetary vehicles. Um, okay, a brief discussion on some of these design drivers. Uh, For the mobility system. Okay, this chart illustrates the importance of ground pressure as a sizing criterion. So the top left diagram is taken from terrestrial vehicles. Higher the ground pressure, the more likely it is that you become immobile in operations, which is expressed here in the diagram on top left as a percentage of no-go terrain. Um, so um, trafficability problems of the inadequate trafficability of the terrain if the vehicle exceeds a certain ground pressure. Um, and then the top right, yes, illustrates such a situation, Earth uh, picture taken during uh, World War II of vehicles becoming immobilized in, in um, uh, mud uh, conditions. Uh, I think this picture was taken in Russia. Um, so they, they were exceeding clearly the recommended ground pressure For the, for the particular terrain condition, uh, admittedly, which probably was not a design case. And on the bottom row of this chart, um, you see the example on Mars, where, as I just mentioned before, one of the MER Mars rover spirits, spirit became embedded permanently immobilized on Mars in excessively weak terrain, which was a local occurrence, um, which was not, uh, from images, not expected to be this weak but the rover was directed to drive uh, over a certain patch of terrain and unseen from the ground, um, it was in fact uh, very weak and did not support the ground pressure of the vehicle. This was a one-time instance with spirit and however was enough to permanently immobilize the vehicle. And even ground testing with a full scale rover as shown on the bottom right, um, wasn't able to uh, solve the problem of how to extricate the rover. So uh, many maneuvers were commanded, but the mission ran out of time and then the rover died in the Martian winter because it wasn't able to move and get out of unfavorable tilt towards the sun. And this chart illustrates um, the other important design aspect that I mentioned earlier, which is the suspension kinematics in the presence of ground obstacles in, in natural terrain. You see a terrestrial example on the top left, um, forestry vehicles on earth, like for logging. Um, yes, terrain conditions in a forest can be very rough uh, with, uh, with trunks lying around uh, and you need a clever suspension for these logging vehicles to be able to move um, over obstacles. So that's important. Um, in the bottom left, it's one of the famous Italian uh, Pavesi vehicles, articulated vehicles, a very clever suspension invented by Pavesi, 
the split cap of this was also adopted for planetary rock. we have a dense rock distribution on the surface in many areas on the planet and some different design solutions were devised like in the top in the top center photograph shown here the Mazokot concept of the soviets um, never flew to mars in the end mission was canceled for cost reasons but the suspension is unique it's like drum wheels uh, with lit caps uh, no ground clearance effectively um, but a uh, very capable suspension that allows you to move over rocks without having to avoid them and um, in the center right photograph that's the illustrating the famous rocker bogey six wheel suspension that was invented in the u.s at the jet propulsion laboratory a six wheel suspension um which is very capable in in moving over rocks uh, as opposed to mazokot the rocker bogey does not require split caps of the vehicle main structure of the rover main structure but it allows to have a single box as the rover main structure that is the main difference which is advantageous for thermal reasons it's advantageous to accommodate electronics units and measurement instruments scientific instruments and this concept was flown to Mars in several design manifestations. Um, and then on the bottom right photograph, finally, um, this is the lunar mission, the Soviet uh, remotely controlled lunar court lunar rovers that were successfully flown to the moon, two of those. This is showing a test model for tests on Earth in Kamchatka. And this was, was an eight-wheeled uh, mobility system um, with uh, let's say torsion bar suspension uh, of wheel pairs and was quite capable and adequate for the lunar surface which has fewer rocks on the ground but has these undulated um, has these undulated uh, terrains with shallow craters uh, depressions right and as we design the mobility system of a planetary or lunar rover, um, some trade-offs have to be made. Some design choices need to be made. Uh, for instance, I always say we can actually apply the so-called golden triangle of uh, military ground vehicle design that's shown on the left. Um, we can actually apply that also to the case of planetary vehicles, uh, planetary ground vehicles. Because the Golden Triangle talks about, about uh, trading in heaven for increased protection for payload capacity. So you cannot satisfy all three conditions. If you want to maximize payload mass to be carried by the ground vehicle, then you have to sacrifice in mobility capability and you have to sacrifice probably in armor for, for mass reasons, for weight reasons, for ground pressure reasons, ultimately. Um, and then conversely, if you want to have enhanced mobility, you have to sacrifice for the in the amount of payload they're able to carry and so on. It's the same with planetary surface vehicles. We have to make compromises. So what's driving the design of the mission? A planetary rover is not developed and built for mobility per se, but it, it's got a mission. It's got a mission to carry a payload of measurement instruments, of sampling equipment. So there's a certain mass and volume to be accommodated with its own field of view and access requirements to the terrain. And this needs to be satisfied in the design. Uh, so it's not like we can optimize the mobility system by itself, but uh, in concert with other aspects. of the vehicle um i was okay this this we leave out okay i was going to show this here um so what's imp important so for successful design for successful design of a rover, this is taken from uh, mission data of the mass exploration rover mission of nasa so with spirit and opportunity two rovers same design sent to mars about 15 years ago and they were in operation for more than 10 years on mars 
Um, this is taken from measured performance of the opportunity MERB. Um, so measured uh, or reconstructed, let's say, rover slip as a function of time. So time is expressed in SOL. SOL means number of days on Mars. Um, so it's just a consecutive numbering here. So SOL 2000 would mean 2000 Martian days after that rover had been landed on Mars. And um, so one day on Mars, by the way, is roughly as long as a day on Earth, slightly longer, like half an hour, 40 minutes longer than a day on Earth to give you a scale. So this is just a snapshot of reconstructed rover slip versus time and implicitly therefore versus distance traveled on the ground. And you see that that wheel slip um, was usually uh, well below 20%, so even below 10%, which is great. If you compare to terrestrial ground vehicles, wheeled, wheeled ground vehicles on Earth, in natural terrains, like in the military, armored wheel vehicles, um, for instance, slip. Um, yeah, it's about the same order of magnitude, perhaps slightly more in the 20% area, which is considered a good design. Uh, so here on Mars for ME, for the MER rover design, also we have been seeing a very favorable slip because if slip is high, then there is a chance of immobilization because the vehicle would sink in more into the terrain. Um, so you want to minimize uh, slip. And there were some occasions of, of very high slip, up to 60% or even beyond that, but only when like so-called ripples were crossed by the rover. So ripples are like shallow sand dunes, which um, are constituted of a much weaker sediment as compared to the normal uh, substrate, let's say. So that, that is explainable that on those occasions, slip was higher, um, but not threatening to the mission because these ripples don't have a long extension. So a wheel pair will be in contact with a single ripple and then another wheel pair and then another wheel pair, not all six wheels of that vehicle at the same time. Yes, so therefore the so-called planetary terror mechanics is important. So um, mobility system sizing models using terror mechanics, but applied to the problem of planetary or, or lunar uh, vehicles. And like as just as well as we use such models for development of ground vehicles on Earth, um, these models also help us to predict the same quantities then for a planetary rover or lunar rover. So resistive forces, we are able to model resistive forces, so motion resistance while we're driving. Um, uh, how however, also draw by pulse or with the vehicle as a function of design choices. And and gradeability, in other words, we can convert drawback pull into ability. So what slope are we able to climb? And also then the required drive torque on the motor drives, we can predict with the associated input power, which is important for the design of the power system of the rover. So all of this is, is uh, analogous to how we apply terra mechanical models on Earth. And so basically, Terra mechanical modeling for planetary and lunar rovers involves, of course, uh, a description of the terrain that the vehicle is supposed to move on. So planetary environment in terms of uh, terrain physical properties and then the obstacle distribution. And then um, you assume design sizings for the wheels uh, in terms of diameter width, um, uh, and then intro uh, introduce that into your model and thereby predict uh, performance parameters. Um, and such predictive models, this is just a, a top level logic here, you're able to apply in the design phase 
So you can use it in a parametric way to vary the number of wheels in the design, to vary wheel sizing in the design. Um, however, you can also use it then uh, to support the design at a later stage of development, like simulating the operations of the motor drive units and motor control strategies. Um, this is usually input into the simulation uh, as well. And then during mission operations, you can apply the simulation to predict uh, rover behavior for an intended section uh, or segment of a drive. Right, let's go over some mission examples next. Um, some design solutions that have been successful on the moon and on Mars. Some photographs on the more on the left hand portion of the slide, it's lunar vehicles, the lunar cord, uh, and then the Apollo crewed lunar rover that was sent to the moon on the final three Apollo missions with astronauts. Um, and then more on the right hand portion of the slide, you see Mars rover examples. The top right photograph is important because it shows the three design sizings of the NASA JPL Rocker Bogey six wheeled suspension that were successfully sent to Mars and operated on Mars. So shown to scale with full scale test models and humans for comparison. Uh, so it's all the basic, uh, basically the same six-wheeled rocker bogey suspension, but realized in three different physical sizes of the design. So the spirit and opportunity that I was mentioning a few times already, uh, that's Emmy Archer. 2004 was the year that they were landed on Mars. And seven years before that, it was the Pathfinder mission um, deploying the... smallest version of this suspension sojourner rover and then it's curiosity in 2012 and then succeeded by perseverance that landed just this year um bottom view on this slide is showing the chinese zhurong mars rover that successfully was delivered to the surface of mars in may of this year let's not forget china has successfully landed on mars um, with their own mars rover and and in europe we have been working on the exo mars mission for uh a long time already and it's finally bound to launch next year after many delays uh, right it, it's interesting to look at the the nasa jpl rocker bogey uh, design sizings remember on the previous slide there was this photograph with full-scale test rovers with humans for comparison um, and this is kind of continued the story on this slide, just showing that um, the wheels of these three different design sizings, they vary greatly in size, um, but that's not, I mean, by chance, but to keep the ground pressure within limits. In fact, the ground pressure is about the same order of magnitude in all of these three design sizings, simply owing to the change in diameter and width of the wheel so it was a careful decision where the wheel design was concerned to keep the ground pressure at about the same order of magnitude just below 10 kilopascals which is a good sizing um, for natural terrains also for terrestrial vehicles even though the mass of the corresponding rover varies um, greatly uh, so, uh, or the weight on Mars, uh, or the wheel load, let's say, vertical load per wheel varying from 7 newtons for the tiny Sojourner rover to about 600 newtons for MSL and Perseverance. And the ground pressure in all cases is about the same, which is essential. Um, Yes, and then Mars rovers have been covering great distances. So Opportunity is the record holder, lasted on Mars for more than 14 years and covered more than 40, 40 kilometers in the process. This is the, the map on the right-hand portion of this slide, top view, 
year plotted against uh, locations along the yellow trajectory. And then spirits trajectory is shown on the left hand side. Uh, for comparison, a curiosity has covered just, I think, um, 20 kilometers in eight years and perseverance just landed this year. But again, the point is not to cover ground. The point is to do to provide access to scientifically compelling targets as selected by people on the ground. And this is the shown in this chart. Planetary rovers are not just doing their thing on their own and occasionally sending data to Earth. No, it's just the other way around. There's always uh, a ground team that's telling the vehicle what to do. Um, and the, these photographs were taken during the MIR mission. I took these pictures. Uh, this was at JPL. Um, so there is a science team that looks at the data and that plans on the vehicle's next move, um, depending on science priorities. And then, of course, there's local autonomy um, for the vehicle to, to do its thing for a day for or two days on its own. But then it's directed again, uh, interacted with from the ground. Uh, yes, this is the Curiosity Mars rover that, uh, that landed on Mars eight years ago, nine years ago. Uh, next bigger uh, design sizing of the rocker bogey. Uh, and this was um, now uh, succeeded by Perseverance that landed this year. About the, the same design sizing. Uh, right. And... Um, Right, so let's go to this page. This is showing the Chinese Mars rover, the Zhurong, which also uses a six-wheel suspension. I mean, also because uh, at first glance, it may resemble the JPL rocker bogey suspension. In reality, it's not because it's a hybrid suspension. So there is a motorized degree of freedom in um, one of the suspension arms um, that allows an active adjustment of the rover ground, ground clearance independently on both sides of the rover. And this is a degree, this is a unique design. And uh, it was implemented by the Chinese to have an, a degree of freedom in um, freeing the vehicle should it get stuck. So, something that the NASA JPL rocker bogey designs do not have the suspensions. They are purely passive. Um, but here, this is a hybrid solution. Um, so partially active suspension and passive suspension. And this greatly increases the chances of getting out of immobilization if you were to get immobilized. So far, it has not happened on the mission. The mission landed on Mars in May. Yes, the European ExoMars mission is going <clears throat> going to go next uh, with its Mars rover. Um, and I've been involved in, in the development of this mobility system myself. It's six wheels. It is a passive suspension. It's different from the rocker bogey. It's somewhat uh, less capable than the rocker bogey, I would say, with regards to obstacle negotiation. But it's very good for... Uh, trying to keep the weight equal on all of the stools than the rocker bogey suspension. And the wheels here are flexible. This is a unique feature in the actual Mars mobility system. Rather than rigid wheels, they use flexible metallic wheels because they uh, lead to lower ground pressure for the same wheel diameter. So they're allowed to have the wheels to be a little bit smaller for the same ground pressure. Uh, the Chinese not only landed on Mars just this year, but they have successfully landed two rovers on the moon, one of them on the far side of the moon. And that rover U-2-2 is still in, in operations after more than two years on the lunar surface. And slip has been measured or inferred from mobility data that's shown on the bottom right diagram. The slip ratio usually has been found to be uh, below 5%.
Right, and for lunar missions, we're going, we will be seeing many more lunar rovers coming, uncrewed lunar rovers, especially from so-called commercial lunar landing missions, where there's a number of companies that are working on um, small, relatively small lunar rovers, mainly for technology demonstrations, so few kilograms in mass only. The first of these, the first of this one's going to get to the moon next year if they land successfully uh, with Astrobotic. It's part of the NASA funded commercial lunar program. Yes, this is also illustrated on this chart. So rover mass um, versus let's say travel distance or, or design capability for range. You see that the commercial lunar micro rovers of the next few years will be in the bottom left of this diagram. Quite limited range. Yes, and how do we model and simulate really rover mobility in the design phase? Coming back to the original question. Um, Yes, so as with ground vehicles for use on Earth, there are several different types of models that can be applied in the design phase for the mobility system. So on Earth, we use a lot empirical models for terrestrial ground vehicles, especially in the military. Uh, the most prominent example is the NATO reference mobility model, NRMM. Um, that's been constantly improved and expanded in capability. It relies very much on describing the terrain through cone index, which is a quantity that's easily measurable also in the field, in the terrain. And there are like empirical metrics that have been developed over the decades to predict mobility of a ground vehicle as function of cone index. Of terrain strength. <clears throat> it's a very simplistic way of looking at the problem. Um, however, it's it's easily used, uh, not computationally intensive, but you need to know the terrain characteristics in terms of the cone index, otherwise you cannot apply the systematics. Um, and um, so basically <clears throat> you um, you have to, uh, there are equations to predict for a given vehicle design sizing what the minimum terrain strength would have to be for it to successfully operate. That's as far as it goes. So basically a go, no go assessment. A more advanced version of the NATO reference mobility model um, has the capability to be more quantitative in the prediction, in the assessment, more physics-based, let's say. Um, but the original formulation is really basically a go-no-go -no -go assessment. And you can use that in a design phase uh, to predict the required strength of terrain. Um, and for planetary vehicles, it hasn't really been used so far. Uh, in Russia, in Russia, when in Russia, the or Soviet Union uh, 50 years ago uh, for development of the Lunokot uh, lunar rovers that were remotely controlled from Earth, when their mobility systems were developed by the Institute Transmash in St. Petersburg, back then Leningrad, they very much relied on testing. So they built a bunch of prototypes of mobility test models, tested them indoors under controlled terrain in conditions, even for <coughs> parabolic flights for single wheel testing to look at the effect of gravity on the terrain properties. Um, they produce a lot of data to uh, come up with, so, uh, with dimensionless mobility parameters that were used in predicting uh, mobility performance of different design variations but still it very much relied on testing of prototypes on earth and um, this shows one of the test models um, developed during the lunar court development program during testing in Kamchatka. 
gradeability testing going up a slope. And basically with this approach, the Russians were able to predict very accurately the drawbar pull versus slip characteristics um, on the lunar terrain at lunar gravity that's shown in the left hand. That's KT is their dimensionless drawbar coefficient, so drawbar pull uh, relative to vehicle weight as a function of slip ratio that's on the horizontal axis, slip ratio S uh, going up to 1.0 here. Here for uh, based on with mission data. Um, and also on the right hand side, similarly, um, and uh, the effect of gravity on terrain strength and increased sinkage at lunar gravity was accurately predicted and investigated by the Russians uh, during development of the rovers. So using partial gravity testing in uh, using parabolic flights. And um, okay, these are some mission data from the Lunokot uh, mission operation. So on the left-hand side, we see uh, wheel slip in percent on the vertical axis as a function of slope on the horizontal axis in degrees. So you see as the rovers on the moon were approaching a slope of 24, 26 degrees, slip would, appro uh, would approach 100%. So basically the gradeability on lunar conditions uh, was around 25, 26 degrees or 24 degrees, which is in line with experience also for terrestrial wheeled vehicles, by the way. Also for Mars rovers, um, the MER and Curiosity Mars rovers, they demonstrated similar performance limits on Mars. Um, on the right-hand side, we see motion, the motion resistance plotted um, as function uh, um, of slope angle, which reports a similar property of the design. Right, and then semi-empirical models. Well, um, many of you will be familiar, of course, uh, with Becker, Rees, Wong uh, types of works and models. Um, that rely on interaction parameters um, to be measured uh, on, on representative terrains using bevameters. Um, some views of bevameters shown here, laboratory version on the right, the field version on the left. And this is essential input for <coughs> semi-empirical models in terra mechanics, where let's say the problem of vehicle interaction with the terrain is described through simplified approaches like the vertical loading by a flat plate and the shear load loading by a grouser plate. And then um, you use the interaction parameters measured through bevameters um, to then make quantitative predictions. And such models have been successfully applied uh, also for planetary rovers, for instance, to the Apollo lunar rover. They followed exactly this approach. It's not by chance, but because Becker um, one of the pioneers in Terra mechanics who did some of the initial formulations of the Terra mechanical models, he was deeply involved in development of the Apollo lunar rover and postulated that one could use the same approach also for the case of lunar mobility, so the same type of modeling. And he introduced that um, uh, type of model into development of the Apollo lunar rovers. Uh, so that was backed up by single wheel testing in Vicksburg. Um, uh, back then it was called the Waterways Experiment Station. And the models applied were basically, the model applied was basically the Becker um, semi-empirical model. Uh, which has a load sinkage, sinkage equation um, uh, and models the gross thrust developed by wheel vehicle uh, as modified by slip of the wheel and then the compaction resistance as a function um, of load sinkage of the wheel. <clears throat> then you get total motion resistance 
and reduce your net traction by the motion resistance in uh, which uh, gives you drawbar pull or net pull as it's called here um, this you can also use to predict the drive powers so basically this was applied one-to-one -to, -one to designing the apollo rover mobility system it was also part of a simulation numerical simulation even at the time of the overall mobility system behavior including simulation of the electric motors that were used and of the gearboxes um, and the model used uh, interaction or terrain values that had been first measured on lunar soil simulants on earth and then backed up by measurements of lunar soil properties on the initial lunar landings that did not have a rover and then allowing to make very precise predictions and the model was then correlated with mission data uh, mainly based on energy consumption measured on the rovers on the three apollo lunar rovers with astronauts on the final three apollo missions where of course it was possible to very accurately measure the consumed electrical energy as a function of drive distance and this was used as a quantity to correlate the models and correlation was excellent as shown uh, in the diagrams on the right so these are predictions of energy consumption versus distance traveled versus data points of measured uh, energy used. so that was a success story and in Europe also we have been working on semi-empirical models for planetary rover uh, design sizing for the European Space Agency. I myself was involved in a lot of this work um, where especially we looked at smaller rover designs, so more lightweight than let's say the Apollo lunar rover with astronauts and we had to make certain adaptations to the classical Becker formulation. Also we had to come up with a slip sinkage model to account for the additional sinkage of uh, wheels due to uh, slippage to fit the data uh, in, obtained in the lab. Other than that, it's fairly conventional, but we had to make some adaptations to account for small wheel loads and small wheel sizes. And we validated the model with single wheel testing as shown here, for instance, in this uh, soil channel. And then also complete more uh, system level drawbar pull tests uh, with, where we did drawbar tests in the lab on Mars soil simulants. And what's shown here is drawbar pull measured versus slip versus prediction. From the model, so-called traction. Level. And this model was then used for parametric design studies also in support of the ExoMars Rovability system development. Uh, so you would be able to input into the correlated model, uh, you would be able to input uh, wheel diameter, wheel width, other wheel design features like browser characteristics, and then we load, and then the model will give you a pull versus slip, and then the predicted gradability, uh, sinkage, uh, required drive torque, and so on and so forth, as shown in this table. It was then applied, yes, to the design of the ExoMars rover wheel, which um, is a flexible wheel. And so we adapted the predictive model to handle flexible metallic wheels and validated the model for that. Uh, the validation is shown in the diagrams on the bottom left of this chart. Um, through extensive single wheel tests. It has been all designed and built, yes, and rover systems now, the mission is now finally slated to launch uh, next year in the next uh, Mars launch window. Um, sometimes, uh, or some workers uh, take such semi-empirical um, terra mechanics models for wheeled rovers and couple them to a multi-body simulation like in Adams for instance this was done for instance at Washington University in St. Louis they were involved in a NASA Mars rover mission so they they built an, an simulation environment in Adams that includes a wheel soil interaction model uh, using a semi-empirical model and they were able to uh, 
apply that to mission data on the MER Mars rover mission and later Curiosity that was possible to successfully import mission data there and, and see a good agreement in terms of sinkage and also wheel current, let's say motor current. Um, yes, and it's multi-body, so it allows you to model also suspension movements as a function of terrain shape. And in China, there was an interesting effort, of course, in support of their lunar and Mars rover programs. They did their own um, simulation and modeling work uh, for lunar and planetary rovers. A lot of this was led by Liang Ding from Harbin Institute of Technology, who, by the way, is going to be chairing next year's ISTVS meeting in China, in Harbin, if all goes well. And especially the, they also applied a semi-empirical approach pretty much derived from the Becker method. However, they came up with an interesting slip sinkage model. I find it interesting um, the way they model slip sinkage. So the additional sinkage of the wheel that you get by the wheel slipping. Um, there are several ways of modeling that and they found an interesting way that they correlated with, with um, test data uh, from single wheel tests so they modified the load sinkage equation basically so they they modify the exponent of soil sinkage n they modify that uh, to account for the slip um, and so this was successfully validated by uh, with test data in the lab and and such modeling was included in multi-body simulation that they apply to the full design sizing of their U2 lunar rovers and of the Zhurong Mars rover. And uh, these models are today also used in mission operations to, to plan rover drive segments. Analytical models, that's another approach to the problem where um, in principle, you can think of finite element modeling of the terrain, a finite element representation of the terrain, and then model the interaction of that with the rover, um, or discrete element modeling, DEM, where of course, both of these methods are computationally quite in, uh, expensive and intensive. But the advantage is, or the promise, the promise is you would rely less on laboratory experiments uh, you wouldn't have to deal with barometers to measure terrain parameters. Um, however, some link to reality is necessary. You do rely on some laboratory measurements. However, um, they may be more universal. Um, but let's say uh, of the two, the discrete element modeling certainly is more capable because it allows in principle for infinitely large displacements of soil particles in response to wheel interactions, whereas finite element modeling always has an inherent limitation on, on the strain because it operates in the elastic regime basically of the medium. However, both have been applied, both approaches have been applied to the problem of planetary rover mobility modeling so finite element modeling approaches have been done um, and uh, also discrete element modeling approaches have been implemented and, and correlated with experiments in the lab and correlated with mission data. It's hard, but it is possible. So you can run a large number of simulations and produce lookup tables, for instance, that's the usual way, and then use that for design parametric studies. That is the typical approach um, that you then do with these analytical models. But one has to say it's not widely adopted in the science of developing a planetary or lunar rover because of the computational effort. But they're very suitable, very much suitable to study fundamental problems in wheel or tracked mobility or legged mobility, if you will. Um, what is the effect of browsers in detail? How is soil displaced? Uh, how, is, how do soil particles really move in relation to the wheel in detail at the microscopic level? This is what these methods are great for. 
um, rather than for efficient design sizings um, and parametric studies. Okay, some, yes, uh, FEM-based simulations and results in correlations with lab measurements. And also combinations have been tried of finite element modeling and discrete element modeling. Um, yes, with varying successes. Effects of gravity, this is the final aspect I was going to touch on. Um, it's important, yes, because on the moon and on Mars and on other bodies, gravity is different from the one here on Earth. And basically the effects are twofold. Obviously, the, the weight of rover, if you do if you do ground testing on Earth of a full-scale rover, right, on Earth, um, important thing number one is the weight, of course, is a different one in testing on Earth. Um, second effect is on the behavior of the soil itself because the stress-strain behavior of the soil also depends on gravity because obviously the soil particles are in a different gravity environment. were left unchanged that would decrease as you decrease the gravity level so in other words the rover would sink in more for the same weight which is dangerous so you either way you have to account for this when testing on earth for planetary and lunar rovers and there are several ways of doing that you see these photographs that address the first point which is the diff the weight difference of the rover if you have a full mass test rover model that you want to run through tests, you need to reduce the weight of it by a suspension from above, for instance. On the left-hand side, this is how it was done in China for the U2 lunar rover. They had like an overhead crane following the motion of the vehicle and uh, five the rover's weight. And on the right-hand side, you see the helium balloon method done in India for the Indian small lunar rover, the Pragyam, um, which was an Indian lunar mission which crashed during landing two years ago. Um, they were going to refly it, by the way. Oh, but then you will still have to separately address the effect of the difference in gravity on the strength of the soil. And this you can also do in several ways. But it's important to consider of gravity on the strength of the soil can be addressed as you can do parabolic flight experiments like was done earlier on already in the Soviet Union for the lunar court. Um, and then lately also in Japan, a lot of work was done in this regard. And then now in, in Canada, they have a nice activity here. Another way is to use a scaled soil in testing on Earth, which is the soil particles <clears throat> in your test soil when testing on the ground, have a smaller density than the, for instance, this was done in China for some test runs with single wheels of their lunar rover. They were working with a scaled soil. I found it very interesting. It's like a fly ash kind of material that was artificially produced. Um, and there, of course, the weight of column would be the same as the weight of the real lunar soil under lunar gravity. So you can compensate uh, the effect of gravity on the soil strength this that way. Model inversion, I think we can uh, skip that. Um, I mean, once you've got a well-correlated predictive model for motion resistance as a function of soil strength or for wheel sinkage as a function of soil strength, you can invert the model in mission operations. If you measure rut depths behind your rover in the terrain, you can use the model inversion to solve for the soil properties, for the strength parameters, if you take certain assumptions. It's not a unique solution. You have to guess, let's say, one or two of the parameters and then solve for the remaining ones. But this has been done for Mars missions. I was working on this myself, for instance, on, on the Spirit and Opportunity MER Mars rovers. I did that myself um, to get to estimates of the, uh, the Becker type interaction parameters for Mars soils. 
Um, and, um, and in China, a similar work was done that's now being going to be published soon uh, for the U-2-2 lunar rover. Uh, the same approach was followed to invert their predictive model for lunar soil properties at that landing site there for U-2-2. It's useful, it's interesting. Um, in the absence of a dedicated instrument to measure soil strength, you can use the mobility system that you already, already have and use a predictive model that you will have correlated during development and then invert it using mission data uh, and then solve for the terrain strength, which is useful science. Terrain strength as a function of drive distance um, and so on. Um, yes, and there is a ch general challenge associated with correlating such predictive models. I mean, you can do correlation on the ground with laboratory testing, yes. But if you want to correlate your models with mission data from real missions, as was just shown, you can invert predictive models. Yes, but it's not never a unique solution because you do not have dedicated measurement instruments. instruments. And uh, let's say the telemetry, the technical information you get back from the mobility system of a rover on the moon or on Mars or, or wherever is not as comprehensive as you would like. Um, you do not get a direct measurement of slip. You have to infer from other means uh, because of the lack of sensors or the difficulty to implement sensors. Because a number of sensor types are difficult to actually qualify for use in space like strain gauges to measure forces, like forces, load cells. Uh, usually on space missions, you do not have load cells um, because they will not work um, under the given, uh, they're too sensitive. Uh, they will not work under the given temperature conditions or vacuum conditions or temperature swings and so on and so forth. Um, yes, however, the bottom point here is kind of promising so there are new trends because as we have more and more computing power on board of planetary and lunar rovers it's becoming easier to have on board on board vision uh, or image processing to give you more insight into the performance of the mobility system that will help to correlate your models yes okay this was the final slide um thank you yes and uh, i know i was running a bit long but i hope we have time for q and a and i think andres was going to uh to run us through the q and a part right i haven't been able to see the q and a or let's say any questions posted in real time because i'm working with a single screen here only um okay. but yes uh, thanks a lot dr uh Lutz, that was a very insightful um, presentation that you gave us. Um, I quickly want to ask the audience that if you feel that you would like to uh, jump on live to ask a question um, in person, then you are free to do so by clicking the blue um, share audio and video button on your right hand side. Um, I see we have one taker, uh, Professor Kovaches, um, the stage is yours. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Lutz, for the very nice presentation. I have, I have a couple of questions, um, some more specific questions. One is uh, on, related to slide 11. I don't know if you can bring that back. Yes, hang on. Hang on, yes. Good that we have page numbers. <laughs> Or let's say there's ah the, the <laughs> measured slip versus uh, yes. covered on opportunity. Yeah, yeah. I I do the screen share in a second. Okay, you see it. Yes, my question was that I somehow missed that you mentioned that this also shows the travel distance because I I I saw only the slip and the the soil data. Right. No, you're right. It's implicit. I, I was saying oh, yeah, it's okay. implicitly implicitly a function of travel distance. Um, 
but yes, there are different, there are other diagrams that I could have put out which have explicitly the, uh, the, the drive distance on the horizontal axis. But this one, yes, a function of Sol or time. Yeah. Um, but in reality, there's, there is a distance that was traveled in between. Yes. Uh, but it's not to scale. Of course, the motion speed was different. The ground covered, uh, the amount of ground covered varied from Sol to Sol. And the rover was not always moving anyway. Um, that, that's the nature of planetary rovers. They don't always move. Yes. yes, yes <laughs> because yes, they do yes. measurements on the spot or they take samples on the spot and then they can sit there for a week, for two weeks, for four weeks until the scientists are satisfied and then they can move on. Right. Yes. No, it was really only as a function of time. Mm -hmm. Yes, I see. I see. Yeah, thank you. The other question I have, I don't know, you mentioned, of course, that the ground pressure is a very important uh, design consideration. And this brings up, of course, and I think you had a slide which mentioned is the wheel versus track, let's say, dilemma. Uh, most uh, rovers, especially Martian rovers, no, were designed with wheels. Uh, I just wanted to ask what your thoughts on that, of the possibility of potentially using tracks for uh, planetary exploration also. Right, right. In fact, the Russians, this I know from them because they told me personally uh, years ago, the ones that were still alive from the lunar code era, the, it's also described in their literature. When they developed the lunar code rovers in the Soviet Union, they were considering also options of track vehicles because mm -hmm. they started from like military ground vehicles. So uh, tank-like mobility was, was one of the options. However, they, they built prototypes, they did, built demonstrators, tested them, and then discarded the idea because, yeah. okay, there's several things. Uh, so one is power efficiency is low for tracked systems. So the losses, mechanical losses are very high. Um, you lose, a, uh, the if mechanical efficiency is quite low. Um, on Earth, it doesn't make a difference. You've got a huge power plant right in inside installed in a tank and also on earth a track vehicle is supposed to be very agile accelerate have a great uh, good acceleration capability to achieve a high motion speed power is not a concern because you've got uh, megawatts uh, installed there or hundreds of kilowatts at the uh, megawatts installed as a power plant um, but for space vehicles Power mm -hmm. is very, 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 very limited. So you've got like even the largest Mars rovers, they for mobility, so for running the wheel drives, they never consume more than about 100 watts of input electrical power. That's about yeah. the limitation. Also because they can move quite slowly. It scales uh, with the motion speed, of course. So, okay, and for ground pressure, it was found out that you can easily come to wheel sizings that, that get you ground pressures of not more than 10 kilopascals, for mm -hmm. instance, which is perfectly fine under normal circumstances. It's just that, as seen on this slide, as I was mentioning, there may be local spots where the ground is much weaker, doesn't even support 10 kilopascals, like with Spirit in this case, was like a crust at the surface which the vehicle broke through and underneath there was this very weak sediment um, and then the wheels kept spinning during this drive and then with slip sinkage it was embedding itself even more so normally wheel design sizings can easily be found uh, for for low enough ground pressure and it's mechanically much more simple to have a wheel than to have a track and the russians also found that out in their testing that of course you can get something between the wheel and the rollers or the sprocket and like rocks stones um they can lead to blockage and then you would be stuck um and again the power losses are that that yes. was a concern too that's why that's why so far no it was never seriously considered to have tracks yes. no yes yes no i understand yes thanks uh, maybe one more question i had you mentioned that the chinese rover is using an octave uh, degree uh, of freedom for the uh, for the suspension and right. I was wondering, some years ago, we were looking at uh, ExoMars-like designs and considering what we call the wheel walking option. Right, right. Uh, 
would this be something like that or this is for the Chinese design is different? Right. The okay, you're seeing the ExoMars slide? Yes. Okay, right. On the bottom right, you see basically the suspension here. Uh, the wheel walking is indeed in there. Uh, yes. It's in the design, so which means each one of the six wheels individually, individually you're able to rotate about its um, lever arm. So that the wheel walking is in the design. Yes. And however, the Chinese architecture is a different one. They, if you go to this slide here, you see it's more like the rocker bogey of NASA JPL. If you look at the side view here on the top right, but uh, one of the joints basically is a motorized joint. Okay. Yeah, I see. Uh, so with the rocker, where the rocker interfaces with the rover main structure, this is a motorized degree of freedom. Uh, the bogey is, is purely passive. So which supports two wheels, but then there's the uh, so-called rocker um, where it is hinged to the rover main structure. That's where they have a motorized degree of freedom. So that allows them to adjust the ground clearance. So it's different. It, it's, it departs from the rocker bogey architecture, um, but one of the hinges is motorized, whereas for ExoMars, okay. it's a so-called triple bogey. Yeah, I where see. you have two bogies, um, right, independent from one another, and then a third transverse bogey in the back of the rover. Yes. It's not the rocker bogey of NASA. Uh, yes, I see. So it's a different solution, but there is the wheel walking indeed. Mm -hmm. Yes, I see. I see. So the Chinese is, is a motorized, not an additional degree of freedom, but a motorized joint. By it's a motorized walking. joint. It's a yes, motorized joint. walking has an audit degree of freedom, essentially, too. Right. And in right, those moments, right, yes. right, 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 right. Yes. yes, a careful, I mean, it's a subtle different, or not so subtle. It's kind of, it's uh, yes. significant differences. But uh, to the lay person, it may <laughs> may seem all yeah. the same. It's six weird rovers. <laughs> but in, uh, in reality, there are strong differences. Yes, yes. Yes, but thank you. Thank you. This is all my questions. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you, Professor Kovacs. Um, next up, we I see we have uh, Dr. Alex Key also wants to ask a question live. Yeah, hello, Lutz. Uh, what I'll do is I'll turn my camera off so that it doesn't affect the transmission uh, uh -huh. quite so much and just use voice. Um, a lot of interesting um, uh, things you brought up there. I mean, it, you ha this, this isn't, isn't one that you brought up particularly, but it's it's one thing that I've I've thought about in the past, and that is that um, one of the special conditions on planets like Mars is the temperature at the surface and the range that can be encountered. I think for Mars, you've got temper temperature ranges from about twenty degrees C going down to below a hundred, at uh, particularly on the poles. Um, there's not a lot of discussion of low temperatures in some of the simulations, DEM uh, studies on things like sampling, traction, mobility, um, possibly a bit more on machine design, the effect on drives. I would have thought batteries is a, a particularly important consideration. Have you got any comments about the problems of dealing with very low operating temperatures when you're trying to design um, machinery and rovers and taking into account what uh, might be particular problems right right no certainly that that's a key driver that's a key driver in let's say the design of the let's say the electromechanical drive trains for instance if we look again at the uh, the exomars example here uh, the slide should be on the screen um so on the bottom right again, of course, I mean you get a sense. Uh, there's this small inset photograph showing actuators. That that's basically the wheel drive mechanisms and the hubs of the wheels. Um, so these are these involve electric motors, planetary gearboxes, and then uh, further reduction gearboxes like harmonic drives and then structures to encapsulate these actuators and protect them from dust and from sand-sized particles. Mm -hmm. And with rotating seals, 
to keep out these uh, particles to protect the gearboxes. And then, of course, these structures, they will contract, contract and expand in response to the temperature swings. So um, that's driving the design of these encapsulating structures to a large extent. So you have to model that during the design. I mean, using structural design modeling approaches um, and to simulate, let's say, the, the thermoelastic behavior or response of these structural items. Uh, so that's very important. And then also the, the survival and operating temperature ranges of things like electric motors and lubricants, lubricants in the gearboxes um, of the drive units. They have to be specially adapted and they were specially adapted for use on Mars to cope with the temperature ranges. And then there are also heaters, electric heaters for some items to first bring up the units, especially the motor units, units into a certain temperature range before initiating drive maneuvers. Uh, so all of that has to be carefully considered, uh, indeed, indeed. And then there are sensitive elements inside the rover, like the battery, the rechargeable battery um, that sits inside the rover. It's thermally extremely well protected. It cannot get colder than minus 40 degrees centigrade, regardless of what happens right. outside. Um, so the careful thermal control measures in place to make sure the battery never gets below that temperature limit. Um, yeah, it's, it's a strong driver indeed. But for Terra mechanics, let's say for the mobility be a performance, the thing is that um, in the let's say the the operating or the target regions on mars and on the moon where rovers have been dispatched to um at the very ground level humidity and ice is not important it's not a factor it's not present let's say um it, or let's say on mars there's always this minute humidity present in the thin atmosphere of mars there is water vapor and therefore, there's also water vapor within the soil and the pores of the soil. Yes, but it's in the per mil concentration range. So if you have sub-freezing temperatures there in the soil of Mars during the night or early in the morning, yes, this per mil uh, portion of humidity will, will be frozen. But since its concentration is so low, it has a negligible effect on the physical properties of the soil. So therefore, these things are normally not accounted for in the terra mechanical modeling. So it's treated as if it were perfectly dry material, which is okay. a good approximation. Is there any way that moisture can build up under the surface with uh, high humidity and then condensation and then freezing? Has that been uh, found to, to, to be an issue anywhere or is that, uh, uh, does it just evaporate away during the day and then come back at night a little bit? Um, I think the latter, for most places on Mars, the latter is the case. So it would evaporate uh, during the day. However, there was one landing site on Mars that was carefully chosen to be near one of the poles of Mars. I think it's shown on this slide. Um, on the left-hand portion of the slide, that was the Phoenix Mars lander mission of NASA, which did not have a rover. It was a static lander, but it was sent to a high latitude location on Mars. I think it was like 75 degrees northern latitude, where we know from, from other, other types of measurements, we know that Indeed, there at the very surface, you can have ice, appreciable ice content, ground ice in the soil because it's so far north. Um, and there, indeed, the mission was set to confirm that at ground level by sampling using a scoop and analyzing the samples. Um, this was done and this was successful. So it was confirmed that the ice content, the ice is really present at ground level, but that that's high latitude on Mars and no rover mission has been sent there yet to such high okay. latitudes. Um, Are there any situations where you have to close down the rover if the temperature gets too too low because of of issues, issues of energy through batteries or is that right. uh, not right. really something that comes into play? No, on the moon, you have to do that. 
uh, on the moon, you have to do that um, if you want to be long lived on the moon. The moon is a special case because remember, one full day and night cycle on the moon lasts 28 days. So that means on each location on the moon, you have like 14 Earth days of sunshine and then 14 Earth days mm. of darkness. And since you have no atmosphere on the moon, it gets very cold just before sunrise. We have the minimum temperatures like minus 190 centigrade is the ground level minimum mm. temperature. And anything that's supposed to be long lived on the lunar surface, you have to do something in order to survive that condition for 14 earth days no sunlight and with that minimum temperature and the chinese have solved it the russians have solved it for the lunar cots uh, by having radioisotope heaters um, however that's not enough you have to do something in addition um, and that was part of their designs which is to close the by mechanism close the radiator that's part of the thermal design so you have to cover you have to reduce the heat loss to the outside environment by closing the radiator that you need during the day to get rid of excess waste heat from electronics and so on. During the day, it gets very hot on the moon. But that radiator would do you harm during the night. You would lose too much thermal power or thermal energy. That's why there are mechanisms to close the radiator for the night and to reduce the heat loss um, on Mars, you don't have to do that because the night is not very long. It's only like eight hours, 10 hours, like here. Okay. So do you also get problems of high temperature on the moon? Yes. On the moon, you get problems of high temperature. They are around midday on the moon. It's very difficult to sustain operations of your electronics and to do things. Um, so the Chinese lunar rovers that are long lived, the U-2 and U-2-2 lunar rovers, they are designed to shut down or they are commanded to shut down around midday on the moon. So midday is not the period of one hour, but since the lunar's rota moon's rotation is so slow, it's a period of three to four Earth days where they're commanded to shut down, not do anything because otherwise they would get too hot internally. Okay. So what, what you see, this is more of an operational problem than a terra mechanics problem. Yes, yes, because of the humidity or the, let's say the temperature, the effect of temperature on the on the terrain conditions is minimal in most places of interest, let's say. If you go to the poles of Mars, it's different. If you go to the poles of the moon, it's different. Um, but in most places, it doesn't make a difference. Okay, thank you. Matt. Um, thank you, Dr. Keen. Um, we have a next person uh, us wanting to ask questions. Uh, Mr. Ramon, I believe. Yeah. Hi. Hi, everyone. And, uh, first of all, uh, congratulations to ISTVS for this uh, event. And also congratulations to Professor Lutz for his presentation and also his really amazing and impressive career of the GS. So I have two questions. So um, just to say a few words, if you want, if you can, about the, uh, I think that around the slide number 27 or 28, you talk a little bit about commercial programs uh, developed by NASA, um, ESA, the European Space Agency, to uh, collaborate with private companies to send uh, robots to uh, other, uh, you know, to the moon or to Mars. Can you say uh, a little bit about this kind of private or commercial programs? Thank you. Right, right, right. right. I, I, brought I brought up, up the, the, there's, an, there's echo, an echo, by the way. Oops. Oops. Uh, uh, I, I brought I, up the slide again. Yeah, so, okay, so in the U.S., for instance, NASA is funding, NASA is funding a series of small lunar lander missions, uncrewed lunar lander missions through the so-called CLPS or CLPS program. Um, 
So these are lunar landers that can deliver up to 100 kilograms or so of landed payload to the lunar surface. And the first of these missions was supposed to launch this year. It's slipping into next year. Um, led by US actors. So in the US, there are like a handful of, let's say, startup like companies that have received contracts from NASA to do such missions in this CLPS or CLPS uh, program. And, and some of these companies are also working on their small rovers. There's also a Japanese uh, company that, that's funded by uh, venture capital. It's called iSpace. Uh, they are not funded by the Japanese government, but through investors. And they will do lunar landing missions as well. Um, and they have developed the so-called Hakuto rovers, which have only about five kilograms of mass. And it's shown on the bottom of this slide here. It's one of the Hakuto rover prototypes. It's a very small wheeled rovers. The one in the US I'm thinking of is also very small, also four wheeled rover. Um, and these are like technology demonstrators. We will see how they work because they're very, they use component technologies that are pretty much uh, stretching the limits. So they're going for commercial electric motors that are delta tested to demonstrate their work in the temperature range. They will not survive the night on the moon. So they such missions will land and they will operate for three, four, five Earth days until sunset and then everything will die because they're not designed to survive this long lunar night but they can still do useful things on the lunar surface during that time and some of these missions will include small rovers in the us nasa also supports these companies with the commercial lunar rovers like astrobotic they're working on their own small lunar rover and they got nasa funding to support this and then always they get uh, venture capital money to to cover the gap um, and in Japan it's iSpace and in Europe um, these things are being considered but it's not yet approved that in the European Space Agency program something like that will also be done there is talk about it there's talk of also doing a commercial lunar landing mission let's say so-called commercial one where a company like OHB or others could receive a contract from ESA to do a lunar landing mission at a fixed price, uh, attractive price like in the US. Uh, but in Europe, this is yet to be confirmed. In the US, it's fully going ahead. And in Japan, it's fully going ahead. OK, thank you. And uh, so my second question, um, I mean, I know that the answer can be long. So it's just if you can say a few words about uh, uh, what is the importance of autonomy and artificial intelligence in planetary exploration rovers? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, I'm yes, on, yes, sure, yes, yes, I, I knew you, you touched on that subject. that subject. Now, the if you look at this chart here, I didn't well on the subject uh yeah early on of course I, I i was showing this slide here so planetary surface robotics what does it entail and of course autonomy is essential because um for for anything beyond the moon you have no real-time control intervention possibility anyway from earth so you do rely on autonomy even for lunar rovers you want some uh localized autonomy um and autonomy means yeah right what does it mean um let's say drive autonomy or also autonomy in okay autonomy in executing a set of commands that will have been uploaded transmitted to the rover beforehand and would execute on its own but of course so that autonomy can um, also extend and it must extend also to the mobility function of the rover so being able to identify obstacles or I, on its own and react accordingly or identify hazardous conditions on its own and react accordingly. And lately, the past few years, the latter has become very important. Yes, also including uh, artif artificial intelligence. So 
um, identifying hazardous conditions has become uh, something that's finding its way into uh, ground vehicle autonomy, so through AI, which is, for instance, uh, sensing in real time if the ground, if the terrain becomes too weak, or in other words, if the slip of the wheel starts to increase beyond a certain rate, that would be acceptable because that could lead to immobilization. So a real-time detection of pending immobilization, I would say, is becoming a capability um, that is totally within the design space now of uh, terrain vehicles. It was not like that a few years ago, but now it is. Um, classically, mobility autonomy for planetary vehicles has been focused on stereo vision and detecting geometric obstacles in the way ahead in front of the rover and avoiding those, steering around those, or assessing the height. I mean, do stereo imaging, uh, calculate on board the rover autonomously a, a digital elevation model, and then judging against preset limits. Uh, would I be able to drive over this rock? Yes or no? If no, I have to avoid it. That was the autonomous capability that has been used on Mars on, on a number of Mars rover missions successfully. But now the added capability is through artificial intelligence is, let's say, the sensing of dangerous or, or uh, yes, mm, ground conditions. So in the sense of strength, which can be a proxy would be for that, yes, increased wheel slip or strong changes in motor currents uh, while you are moving. And uh, Ramon, I know you you are an expert in especially this uh, this field. So it's good you pose that question. <laughs> Thank you very much, Lut. Um, I, 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 would you like, would to, you add like to add something to that, to Ramon? that Ramon? No, it's, I completely agree. It's, uh, Yes, the, the point is that um, traditionally, um, you know, space agencies um, uh, took care of geometrical objects, but they uh, soon realized that non-geometrical objects is also a really, really important point. And here is where artificial intelligence and terra mechanics both together play a key role. Um, as you said, uh, you know, this is a major concern right now for space agencies. They are working a lot in this area in order to be able to, uh, you know, estimate slippage, sinkage, embedding, etc. So, yeah, it's a it's a it's a very very important point right now. And and uh, and unfortunately, for the terra mechanics community, so we are right. It, 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 you, we are in the right position because, again, this is a major issue uh, combining artificial intelligence and terra mechanics. Yeah, thank you very much, Luz, and congratulations. Right, right. Thanks, Ramon. Thanks, Ramon. And, 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 of course, and, and of course, yeah, course, that, yeah that, that would be in order to avoid situations like shown here on this slide, um, where it was not a capability in the Mars rover system for Spirit and Opportunity. It was not in the design capability to detect autonomously in real time a pending immobilization due to a uh, high wheel slippage. Uh, this could not be detected autonomously on board the rovers. And therefore, there were these instances where these rovers did get bogged down. Um, and in, in, in one case, it was, it was not possible, as I mentioned. So with Spirit, it was not possible to recover the rover from that situation ever. Um, and in the future, yes, with these other techniques, this can be this can be avoided. Okay, thank you, um, Ramon, for your question. Um, there aren't any additional um, live questions that will be asked. So, um, just a reminder to all the participants that the question, the the recording will be available after. Um, after the session on the YouTube or the Vimeo platform. So if you need to leave now um, to do some other tasks, you can always watch the recording. All right, so um, reading from the um, reading from the Q&A's 
uh, sections. Uh, Dr. Lutz, Dimitri asked the question. Uh, it was a very interesting presentation. Can you tell us briefly about the future of a Rover project? What tasks will be faced by the developers? And what should I do to take part in such projects? Right. Uh, maybe start with the latter point. You are based in Russia, I would imagine. Um, if that is the case, how to get involved in such a project? If that is the case, um, right, the, of course, in, in, in the Moscow area, there's the Lavochkin Association, which is like the industrial uh, prime contractor for planetary exploration spacecraft in Russia. It has been this company doing this for decades and they're still having this role. So they, they are leading all still today, the Russian planetary exploration missions, the spacecraft development, the Lavochkin Association as it's called. So they would be a company to approach if you want to work there. I don't know <laughs> what the plans are. And then for mm, mobile vehicles, however, for there in Russia, the planetary and lunar rovers, it was really Vni Transmash, that's a specialized institute, the mobile vehicle engineering institute that developed the mobility systems. And they, so for instance, for the lunar court in back in the times, and also they have been working on Mars rovers on the Mars Accord concept, and they still have some limited activity today. And so you could contact them, if we need Transmash in uh, St. Petersburg uh, and in academia. I'm not sure who the actors are in Russia. Planetary mobility there, I have to say, I don't know. Right. Okay. But let's say topics, um, upcoming topics. Yes. I mean, what Ramon was mentioning is certainly uh, a current uh, key area is enhanced autonomy uh, for planetary and lunar rovers. So autonomous detection of, of terrain conditions in real time. Um, that, that's an important area of activity. Let's say in terms of technology for these vehicles. And then mission-wise, what's coming up, I think we will, uh, we will see the return of crewed rovers I think that that's the new area now if we've seen many years of robotic Mars rovers or, or uncrewed Mars rovers and then uncrewed lunar rovers with the Chinese. But now, of course, we will see the return of rovers to carry astronauts because that will happen again in the US and probably China with Russia. Uh, so I know that Russia and China will collaborate with the astronautic program going to the moon um, and there will be crewed lunar rovers that will be developed to carry astronauts so larger vehicles again i think that's a future direction that will become the strong also in us uh, there is a nasa program to develop um, a crewed lunar rover in support of the upcoming um, astronaut landings on the moon that will happen later again in this decade uh, Uh, so I think that's that's a future direction um, that is important. Uh, crewed rovers and higher that's associated with astronaut or crewed rovers that the motion speed on the terrain will be higher than we are used to now with the uh, Mars rovers, let's say, that can cover per Mars day perhaps 100 meters. No, for Apollo even. with crew on board and you can be with all its senses to drive the vehicle uh, and of course the speed is then limited by the terrain if it's too rough and the gravity is too low you become unstable if you go too fast uh, so on the moon the limit was like 18 to 20 kilometers per hour uh, that was the upper end that was successfully demonstrated and but we will go back to that speed range which is much, much faster than the current Mars rovers, for instance. Uh, so we will go back to that. So higher speed mobility will be important. Um, then these autonomous features. 
and uh, crude rovers. I think that's that could capture. That's at least my. What I know also from space agencies, uh, there are these commercial, very small vehicles. Yes, like technology demonstrators that will also happen, but that's high risk. And that's done locally at um, that's locally by by commercial actors. It may work, it may fail, who knows? Uh, but they let's say the large scale rover programs with significant funding behind them, that will be more the crude rovers again in the future. All right, thank you uh, for the answer. Then we have a next question in the Q&A from uh, Hubert. Um, it says, did you observe that the lubricating effect of very fine particles found in lunar or Martian uh, regolith affects the performance of terra mechanics models in terms of traction performance for predictions? So the very fine, I didn't catch all of this question so the effect of um fine particles on uh so it is um the lubricating effect of fine particles found on in lunar or martian regolith affect the performance of terra mechanics models in terms of traction performance predictions right very fine particles um okay Okay, I mean, the, the very fine particles, I mean, they, they will be admixed to the soil at large. The, the soil, the terrain, classify terrains on Earth like we classify soils on Earth. So is it like a silty type material? Is it fine sand? Is it... A, 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 Loamy sand, you know, this classification schemes. <clears throat> uh, this we could all, we also uh, apply to uh, to lunar soil and to Mars soil to compare them to soils on Earth. And they will con which is carried by the wind, which can be deposited on, on surfaces and so on, but that wouldn't really have an effect on uh, the... the on the, on the, tra on the terra mechanics. So it answers the question. Um, okay, so next question asks by Julia. Thanks for the presentation. I just wanted to know if you will be by track testing conversion has not been exploited so much for energy exploration. Sorry, sorry, Andres. It looks like your your audio is breaking. So I'm sorry for for jumping in, but I think Lutz uh, couldn't hear your question is it right Lutz that's right the audio was breaking up all that's right okay. the audio was breaking up also for me yeah yeah okay so yeah also uh also your your audio Lutz was was kind of breaking at some points uh so I apologize um with our audience for this inconvenience and uh, there was some kind of issue but uh we have now got down to the final question so uh so i'll read this uh, for you and then then we can we can end the event so uh, our final question is from professor uh, giulio reina and he says uh thanks for the great presentation i just wanted to know your view why track based locomotion has not been exploited so much for planetary exploration beyond the difficulty in stowing. Okay. Um, right. I mean, the, there was a related question on track mobility mm -hmm. before. Um, beyond the difficulty in stowing. Right. The 
no, the thing is the, uh, okay, if we disregard the storage requirement, right? No, there were there are several factors arguing against tracked mobility. Uh, so one is, again, the poor mechanical efficiency. So the rather high power losses, um, which are imp an important aspect for planetary rovers because your electrical onboard power is always very limited because the power supply systems for certain mass, they only have a certain um, capability. I mean, also, yes, I mean, a Tesla car, right, carries, I mean, what's the weight of the battery pack in a Tesla car? Um, I'm not sure, is it like 300 kilos or something? Um, or 200, uh, I don't know if anybody knows, but that that's quite a bit of mass of battery that we can have that we can have on earth in an electric vehicle and of course space rovers are also electric vehicles but we do not have 200 kilograms available for the battery uh, because imagine a a mars rover like curiosity or perseverance the largest mars rovers um, ever successfully uh, developed and, and operated they have a total mass of just of just of of 1000 kilograms and a lot of that is structure and mechanisms and then the payload, the instrumentation they are carrying, and then the battery that they have to store electrical energy. Uh, out of that 1,000 kilogram, the battery is perhaps 30 kilograms, not more than that, perhaps just 20 or even just below that. Um, so if you stipulate the same battery technology to the one that Tesla has, as, as an initial guess, but in reality, the space battery is less efficient, somewhat less efficient, um, but still. So you can imagine you can, your, the power levels you can get from such a battery are much lower uh, than you're able to get from a much larger battery pack on Earth. So your electrical power, and you have to recharge the battery anyway, using solar arrays or in case of curiosity, other heat sources, heat sources or perseverance. Uh, uh, that you have available on, on planetary rovers, lunar rovers to maybe peak power 100 watts, 200 watts in total at any given time for everything. And uh, so for mobility, it's typically... 50 to 100 watts of electrical power that you can input into the drive motors and the track system will burn a good portion of that simply in mechanical losses whereas a wheeled system has much much lower mechanical losses in the drivetrain uh, so that is an important consideration and then all Uh, track mobility uh, is prone to failure, mechanical failure. So if stones get trapped between the track and the rollers or the, the sprocket, um, the thing can jam and uh, you lose mobility. Um, and for wheeled systems, it's much more robust. So it's mechanically lot, much less sensitive uh, to issues. And also you can... <clears throat> easily size a wheeled rover such that ground pressure is still low enough because gravity is lower don't forget uh, so that helps in keeping ground pressure low uh, because on mars we have just one third of earth's gravity on the moon we just have one sixth of earth's gravity so the difference in in gravitational acceleration helps tremendously already to reduce the ground pressure compared to earth and Then if you size the wheel right or the number of wheels then you can have easily ground pressures not exceeding 10 kilopascals 20 kilopascals which is safe for good mobility totally adequate for good mobility uh, you don't need to have tracks that's the message so steering is much more easy for wheeled vehicle precise steering um, that's important to correctly approach or for sampling and much more difficult to do an accurate turn uh, or approach a target in an accurate way that's about all i can think of here uh, in
this uh, <laughs> reasoning against the tracked vehicles, unfortunately. Okay, so look, let's thanks again, and this was uh, with this was our uh, final uh, our final question. So um, I would like to thank again uh, Lutz for uh, giving this very very interesting presentation, and uh, for each one uh, in attendance and for sticking with us even if we our event was was quite longer today but i think it was it was worth the effort because i believe we really had a very uh, interesting discussion so thanks to uh, all of you who posted uh, a question for the q a or joined the live discussion here on stage and before um, be, uh, before I let you go, just uh, very quickly, a uh, couple of final announcements. Uh, I, as you can see on the slide, I've put back on the screen share. Uh, well, you're, you already know of the digital event series because this is one uh, of the events in the series. I just wanted to remind you that at the website that you see here on the right hand side in the slide, uh, you can find all the information about schedule uh, and speakers um, for for the different events in the series, and the page is constantly updated. So please please keep an eye on it. And I would also like to invite any student uh, research group out there uh, to to consider uh, being one of our of the next speakers for the. Uh, informal uh, student-led uh, research seminars that we have uh, alternating um, with the, the Terra Mechanics Bytes. So uh, if you are interested in doing so, please uh, please get in touch with us. And I think you can find the contacts uh, on the ISTVS website. In any case, uh, my email uh, address is gs as, as for general secretary at istvs.org. So I strongly, uh, I think it's a good, uh, it's a good chance to, um, to have a nice uh, and informal discussion with your fellow, fellow students around the world. So I strongly encourage you to, to take this into consideration. And of course, as most of you already know, we are uh, this digital event series uh, is our build up to the 20th International Conference, which is taking place uh, in a month, in a month time now. So from September 27 to September 29th, for the first time in our history, and for the reasons that you all are very very well aware of well, we are having uh, we are holding the conference online and uh, you can find all the relevant information on the website that you you see here on the left on the left hand side of the slide so again thanks uh, Lutz thanks everyone for for joining the event and uh, hope to see you soon in, in the next event thank you very much Thanks, Massimo. Thanks, Jana, in the background, <laughs> driving the the platform basically that allows us to do all these online things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sure. You're right. <laughs> I was forgetting about uh, our uh, phenomenal staff uh, doing the dirty work in the background, mm -hmm. and also a big <laughs> thank to. <laughs> To Mohit, Andres uh, to uh, and Mohit, yeah, Andres appeared on stage today, and then he experienced connection problems right in the end. And yeah, Mohit was just remained in the back with Jenna today. And as Lutz said, uh, thanks again to everyone for uh, the great job you are doing to make uh, all of this uh, possible. So thanks again, and and goodbye, everyone. Bye.